So uh, a very warm welcome to you all across the Irish Sea there. And to get ourselves into a Barkian frame of mind, here is a piece of bark that probably you've all known since you were about three. <laughs> So the prelude, the famous prelude to Bach's first cello suite in G major, um, as if a story were being improvised on the spot, isn't it? And it's typical that that prelude in G major to the first suite, it combines the freedom of a fantasia with a strong sense of direction building to a resounding climax. And this mix of fantasy and logic is what Bach's solo cello suites are all about. Here on your screen, you have one of only two authentic portraits of Bach, painted quite near the end of his life by Elias Hausmann. Bach here, corpulent, bewigged, dignified, learned indeed, holding a page of music, a canon triplex, no less, a triple canon, an emblem of Bach's contrapuntal skill. Um, it's ultra serious, isn't it? And perhaps it slightly skewed our image of Bach. He was a man of flesh and blood. He fathered 20 children. Um, he liked his beer and wine. He enjoyed a pipe of tobacco. Not quite the fifth evangelist then that the, the 19th century often dubbed him. Well, the cello suites, like Bach's solo violin works, were long relegated to teaching fodder and valued only by a small circle of connoisseurs and scholars. And it was only with the inspired advocacy of Pablo Casals, the great Catalan cellist, over a century ago that the cello suites began to enter the concert repertoire. One afternoon in 1890, the 13-year-old cellist alighted on a score of the suites in a Barcelona music shop, the way one does. And more than a decade later, after zealous practice, he unfurled them to the public, bringing out an unsuspected drama and passion in music that had routinely been branded as dry or ascetic. As Casals later put it, how could anyone think of Bach as cold when these suites seem to shine with the most glittering kind of poetry? And the six cello suites are now a rite of passage for cellists, the cellist Bible, if you like. Well, the cello was still a relatively novel instrument in Bach's day and solo cello music was virtually unknown. And one of Bach's aims in composing the suites, especially the last two, the, the most difficult, numbers five and six, seems to have been to explore the cello's technical possibilities to the full, as he stretched the technique of every instrument, and indeed every voice that he wrote for. So exploring the lyricism, the agility, the percussive nature of the cello sometimes, um, and its great range, its impressive range. It's perhaps the, the most versatile of all the string instruments. So these are works that fascinate the mind with their implied richness of harmony and counterpoint, a single instrument, if you like, conjuring a whole universe. But they also set their feet tapping, peasant dances, aristocratic dances, evocations of the hunt, processions, and so on. Um, this is wonderfully physical music. And they've been arranged for pretty well every instrument under the sun, violin, guitar, marimba, jazz band, you name it. They've been given the swingles and the Jacques Lussier treatment, and they've been choreographed frequently by dancers including Mikhail Baryshnikov, Rudolf Nureyev, and Mark Morris. On to the next slide, and here we have the building where the suites were probably composed. This is Bach's house, maybe slightly spruced up for modern consumpton here, but the house where Bach lived, you can see the plaque there, in Curtin. 
um, with a 19th century statue of Bach in the foreground. You know, as so often, it's frustrating, isn't it, with Bach? We have to speculate. Um, but it's probable that these suites were written somewhere around 1718, 1719, um, after Bach's appointment as Kapellmeister to Prince Leopold of Anhalt Kurten. Um, Leopold was a musically cultivated employer. He played the violin and the viola da gamba. Um, and Bach wrote so much of his instrumental music here, um, including, for example, the Brandenburg concertos. We can't even be sure who played the cello suites. Possible candidates, logical, isn't it, are the, uh, the two crack cellists in um, the instrumental ensemble that the Prince maintained, one of them Karl Bernhard Lienicke, the other Christian Ferdinand Abel. They must have had a pretty consummate technique to meet Bach's unprecedented demands there. So the apotheosis of the dance, you might call these suites. Each of the four suites, six suites is built around the four dances, alternately slow and fast of the Baroque suite. The Allemande, Courant, Saraband and the final dance, the Gigue. They really were de rigueur in French, German and Italian Baroque suites. Now, the most famous suite, number one in G major, we've sampled the prelude. Um, here is the Courant. This is a, a triple time dance, originally Italian, um, but had a French makeover. Wide leaps you see between the registers here, Bach exploits. Um, and um, this, in Bach, this imparts an invigorating kick to the rhythms, hops and springs. The Quran really is the scherzo of the sequence in the cello suites. And I brought along Phoebe Carai for this suite, US cellist playing on a Baroque cello. So the opening of the Quran from suite number one. <laughs> sense of bodily movement. You're feeling glad to be alive there in that scintillating courant from the first suite. Well, before the final gigue, um, with which all the suites end, Bach introduces in each of the suites a note of Gallic chic with the so-called galanterie. These were more modern dances, and in suites numbers one and two, they are a pair of minuets, one in the major, G major here, one in the minor, G minor. And the dancing of the minuet was a must-have skill at the Versailles court of Louis XIV, setting the template for refined society throughout Europe. Social and political advancement was impossible if you weren't an expert minuetta, be warned here. So let's then hear Bach um, at his most amenable and graceful here in the first minuet, G major minuet of the first cello suite. Normally in a single line, but just occasionally here, reinforcing, solidifying the harmony with multiple stopping. The cello couldn't play three notes simultaneously, but we have a broken arpeggio here. We'll hear a lot more of those broken arpeggios during the course of the six suites. <laughs> Etc. And the suite ends with a bouncy final gigue there. Yes, the, the gigue, a French take on the English and Irish jig. And of course, in Ireland, the jig became the national dance along with the reel, accompanied by pipe and fiddle. 
Often the gigue has hunting associations, as in the catchy gigue that ends this first sweep. Definitely a whiff of the chase here. <laughs> So on to the second suite, the second suite in D minor, much darker in colouring than the first suite. And what we got on the screen here is the Allemande. The Allemande always in second place in the sixth cello suites. Um, Allemande originated as a lively, even lusty folk dance. Um, in the 15th, 16th century. By Bach's time, it had been civilized for refined consumption in 18th century salons. And Bach, true to form, gives it, especially in this suite, a very melancholy makeover. There are tortuous lines here, an air of troubled introspection to the, uh, the, the music. Really like, like um, the whole suite, this whole D minor suite, this is suffused with an elegiac spirit. We see the four note chords too, to, to solidify the harmony, broken chords of four notes. So um, the way this, this music twists and turns, characteristic of Bach in introspective mode. <laughs> I don't think peasants um, dancing the Allemande uh, fueled by um, a few drafts of, of punch or beer in, in the 16th and 17th century would have recognized Bach's take on this dance. The Sarabande, yes, the, the centerpiece of each of the six suites is the Sarabande, the plangent Sarabande in the D minor suite, a particularly beautiful example. Um, and from this movement and its counterparts in the other suite, it's hard to believe that the Sarabande originated as a fast, hot blooded, even lascivious Spanish dance accompanied by obscene words and the snap of castanets. Bach here <laughs> transforms the original Sarabande into its opposite. This is profoundly melancholy self-communing music um, enriched by frequent double and triple stopping. <laughs> opening of the Sarabande in suite number two, the noble Sarabande, and Sarabande so suited to the gravity and plangency of the cello. On now to suite number three in C major, a brief glance 
at the Bore, the galanterie, the, the modern dance is here, are a pair of bourrées. Um, that's another dance that started life as a racy folk dance. Its origins have been traced to the Auvergne uh, before advancing up the social scale and reaching its apogee at the court of Louis XIV. Um, in this suite, this C major suite, number three, Bach exploits the resonance of the cello's lowest C string, um, but compared with number two, um, the, the mood of the suite far more uh, brighter, more open, more extrovert. This is a, a catchy bourree. Bach is a great melodist um, demonstrated here, but this implied harmony um, throughout, you know, if you've got your notebooks ready, you, you, could, you could sort of fill in the, the harmony, the notebook, a piece of manuscript paper, that's all you need. <laughs> Music guaranteed to set the feet tapping, isn't it? That. Well, here we have the coffee house, Zimmermann's Coffee House in Leipzig, where we are pretty certain that some, if not all, of the cello suites were produced. Um, it's almost certain that they were played at the regular soirees at the Curtain Court. Um, but this is the, the coffee house in Leipzig. Yes, Simon's coffee house in Leipzig. A decade later, Bach's second wife, Anna Magdalena, made fair copies of the suites. Um, and from this, we can infer that they were performed either privately and or at the concerts of the Leipzig Collegium Musicum, which is a mixed body of students, amateurs, and professionals who met in Gottfried Zimmermann's elegant coffee house, which is a magnet for Leipzig Beau Monde. And it was rather more salubrious than other coffee houses, which doubled as houses of ill repute. Suite number four in E flat major. We also have a pair of bourrées, as in number three, um, to the traditional dance sequence. This is E flat, a veiled, slightly veiled key where the, um, the, the strings lose a little bit of their natural resonance. You can't use open strings so much in the key of E flat. And as in number one, the prelude is basically a series of arpeggios. Starts off in relatively plain mode, although we have this flatwood pull, E flat major in the first two bars, a pull flatwards towards the key of A flat major by the end of the first stave there. Um, this is a, obviously a technical exercise um, exploring the, the wide compass of the cello at the, the beginning. So it starts off quite plainly, but we'll see what happens at the end of the movement. <laughs> Might have noticed that the pitch has changed. We've gone up a, a little bit. Um, and um, we've got a modern cellist here for contrast. We've got the great French cellist Paul Tortelier playing, I'm um, using him for suites numbers four, five, and six. Well, let's scroll on to towards the end of this prelude to suite number four, where the music becomes clouded. We have sort of chromatic thickets, almost tortured. Um, these twists, lamenting semitones around here, something we could never have predicted from the, the, the plain, almost mechanical opening. <laughs> Thank you. 
isn't it almost there? Um, the extraordinarily um, contorted, uh, minor key, heavily chromatic conclusion, or almost conclusion, but before the music finally moves back into E flat major um, of the prelude to suite number four. Suite number five, well, uniquely in the, five, in the six cello suites, number five in C minor, which incidentally also exists in a version for lute, um, this requires the highest string to be tuned down from A to G. The, the, we see the, the tuning here, um, C, G, D, that's what you expect. You'd expect the highest string of the cello to be tuned to an A, but no, it is tuned down to a D. That's a practice known as scordatura, literally mistuning, which allows for new chordal spacing while giving the music a distinctively darker color and resonance. The prelude is the most imposing of all six preludes in the suite. It's in the form of a fantasia and fugue, well, like a Baroque French overture. Prelude massive, darkly brooding, and expo exploiting the resonance of the cello's lowest string, the, this bottom C here. We see like a pedal point uh, sounding through the opening bars. Let's hear this very, the very opening of this extraordinary prelude to suite number five. the mind's ear you're, you're hearing a lot more than a single instrument you know that's the, the trick that Bach plays again and again in these cello suites well I mentioned fugue how can you have a fugue with just a single instrument this really fugue which begins here where the the uh, time signature changes to 3-8 this is Bach's supreme achievement in the cello suites in implying a complex fugal texture from a single line. There's no need for the fugal continuation to be explicitly stated. It's all suggested here. Um, the fugue subject we see here, at what I'm circling on the second stave, and then it is repeated um, at a higher tessitura in the following stave. It's repeated actually initially a sixth high. So giving the impression um, at this stage of um, a fugal um, a fully fugal working out, but uh, from here onwards, um, we, we have to imagine it, but so logical is the flow of, of the harmony that um, we can kind of, we can hear the fugue unfolding fully in our minds. Let's just hear the opening. <laughs> Another fugal entry at that uh, point where I've uh, finished there. Um, a wonderful demonstration of well, Bach creating a whole fugal universe from a single instrument here. The Sarah Bond of number five, yes, the work centerpiece as it is with each of the suites here. This is an extraordinarily powerful piece. It's built on an angular, painfully chromatic theme that serves as both a melody and a bass. This is a favorite of many cellists and it featured in Ingmar Bergman's film Cries and Whispers, which some of you may have seen. Um, this is Bach at his most 
somberly inward looking, a private soliloquy that makes absolutely no concessions on the listener. And it's the only saraban you might notice on screen here that has no recourse to multiple stopping. It's just a single line throughout. Let's hear the opening bars. <laughs> so typical of Bach to explore realms of feeling, often dark, almost tortured feeling, in what is ostensibly a technical exercise. No other composer combines that, that quality of intense emotional inwardness and, um, well, a didactic quality, you know, he's teaching you, but at the same time, he's moving you, he's moving the player and the listener profoundly. Suite number six, a saint corde accordé. Oh, yes, now here um, we have music for a five string cello, probably the violoncello piccolo um, as a short lived instrument, it soon became obsolete, a small cello, as it says on the tin, um, that had five strings. And here then the strings are tuned, well, the, 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 the first four are tuned as you would expect with the additional string tuned to E, a top E string there. Um, and this is the most virtuosic as well as the longest of the Bach cello suite. It's a huge challenge to play on a, a four string cello. It's been called rightly a symphony for solo cello this. And time and again, Bach uses the extended range of the uh, five string cello to create an illusion of contrapuntal dialogue between a cello sorry, a treble and a bass instrument. The, uh, the prelude that you see on the screen is a coruscating fantasia in 12-8 jig rhythm. You know, the spirit of the dance is rarely absent from Bach. Um, and it uses, among other things, a technique known as bariolage. You see in the very first bar, um, bariolage, which is rapidly repeated notes sounded across the strings. So the same pitch, but a different color um, in, in those first three notes. And we see the pattern here in the second bar. Something else you might notice here too is dynamic marks. Um, Bach very rarely gives dynamic marks. You know, he assumes that any um, half competent player or singer can, you know, can get the dynamics from the music implied. But here, uh, okay, the first bar is editorial in brackets forte, but Bach marks bar two piano, forte, piano, forte, and so on. So we get um, both dialogue and echo effects here. Let's then hear the opening of this monstrously difficult but hugely invigorating prelude from suite number six. <laughs> there and you might notice too that whereas the previous five suites have been written entirely in the bass clef 
suite number six um, uses, well, the alto clef, and later on we also get the soprano clef here. So Bach exploiting um, the full range of, of this uh, five string cello. Sarabande here using, in total contrast to the Sarabande from number five, which is written in a single line, the Sarabande using multiple stopping almost throughout to conjure sonorities of majestic depth. This really is like a whole orchestra of cellos. And um, the, the cello with five strings and a flatter bridge made slow writing across the strings easier to sustain. So let's then hear um, the opening of this um, of the saraband with the orchestra of cellos. Uh, this is really um, quite astonishing. Imagine um, the impact that this would have had in Zimmerman's coffee house or wherever in the 1720s. <laughs> feature of the Sarabande, and we've sampled a, a few, haven't we, um, is the slight emphasis on the second beat of the bar there, which we heard very clearly in, in that performance from um, Paul Tortelier. Well, the galanterie in both the fifth and the sixth suites are a pair of gavottes. Uh, this is another folk dance given an elegant French makeover. This is probably the most famous single movement in all the cello suites. It has one of Bach's catchiest tunes. It's been made popular in arrangements for guitar, lute, or even, and I hesitate to say this, is a mobile ringtone. I haven't helped us. Go on. Um, and um, you, you will hear against the melody an evocation of musette drones, bagpipe drones. This music of idealised rusticity there, but refined for domestic, middle class or aristocratic consumption. <laughs> to the final gig, really Bach ending, about ending with a bang. This is in a virtuosic suite, the most virtuosic movement of all, a tour de force that has the cello cavorting across its entire three octave compass. You, you can see it cavorting, I mean, just the, the bars that I'm ringing here um, from the deep bass and we're going in, into the soprano clef there so just in those two bars there's a huge amount of cavorting here. Um, hints as we heard in the gavotte, hints of rustic drones, um, quadruple stopping, this is phenomenally difficult music uh, for the cello whatever the instrument you're playing it on um, and um, it uh, was obviously intended to make a spectacular effect. Um, so let me leave you then with this feel-good gig from the sixth suite, which I hope has whetted your appetite for the complete Bach cello experience. Thank you all for your company. <laughs>